Okay, so now we have uh, we have the whole implicit function theorem, pretty much full generality, uh, nonlinear functions, uh, any number of variables uh, in both the uh, the domain and the target space here, as I'll call them. Uh, but now, recall that when we applied the implicit function theorem without having actually written out the theorem yet, when we applied the ideas in the implicit function theorem to that Cournot duopoly example that we did over here, uh, I actually changed the notation of the variables. And so you'll recall that what I did there was I wrote, uh, instead of writing, in fact, here let me write uh, x and y the x and the y, like over here, but in our application to the Cournot duopoly problem, the x's were, from the point of view of the firm, uh, the x's were kind of exogenous parameters, and so uh, I don't know if I used the word parameter then, but so the x was a parameter, and of course here we have multiple variables x, so it'd be parameters, so let's just put that in. And I used uh, theta instead of x as the, as the notation there. And then for the y, I'm going to call this the target variables. The target variables, maybe I'll put the target variables uh, the decision variables for the firm, and of course there was only one because it was a one-dimensional problem, target variables, and there I used Q instead of Y because it was natural to use Q for quantity, the quantity the firm was going to choose, and theta wasn't perhaps completely natural. Typically when we do the Cournot duopoly example, at least when I do it, and I think when most people teach it or, or work on it, uh, they just use firm 1 and firm 2, or firm A and firm B. So this would be Q sub 1 would be the firm, uh, firm 1 when it's making its decision. And we might use Q2 as the uh, production level of the rival firm to firm 1. But I used theta intentionally because from the point of view of the firm that's maximizing profit here in this duopoly problem, the, the, the rival's production level is a parameter. That is, something that's exogenous. The, the firm that's making the decision here doesn't have any control over that and takes that as, we assume, takes that as given. So we treat that, the firm treats that as a parameter. And so we have already, when we talk about, for example, the solution function and the value function, we use the notation theta for parameters. Theta for a one-dimensional, one variable parameter, and also theta as a vector of parameters, theta 1, let's say, to theta m. And we use, typically we used x instead of q for the, the target or decision variables, uh, and that's what we used when we talked about the solution function and the value function. I used q and not x, partly because Q is standard in the Cournot duopoly problem. It's part of why I use the duopoly problem as the example. And if I used X, it would be confused with the X over here. Here, the, this is the target or decision variable. Here, this is the source or domain variable, the, like the parameter. So here, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to rewrite the implicit function theorem with changing all the notation from the kind of notation, in fact, the exact notation, that you will see when you look at the implicit function theorem in a book on mathematics. Uh, if you go to a website that treats the implicit function theorem and it's not a math for economists website, you're going to see exactly this notation. Everybody uses this notation, which is why I presented the implicit function theorem in this notation. This is the notation, you're going to see X and Y, capital X, capital Y, you're going to see capital F, you're going to see capital F at X bar Y bar, or X star Y star equals C. Everything is going to be exactly this notation. But 
in Mathematics for Economists books, you're going to see all kinds of different notation um, for the parameters. You're going to see theta. You're going to see t. You're going to see alpha. Uh, you're going to see all kinds of different notation for the parameters. They will replace the x's here, as they did down here. And you'll typically see the same notation for most people for these, but they'll be x's. So the x's have people use x's not for the domain or parameters, but rather for the target variables, the decision variables, or the endogenous variables in the in equilibrium analysis. So I'm going to rewrite this, and I'm going to try to do it a little more quickly, uh, translating everything into the kind of uh, parameter and decision variable, or parameter and target variable notation that we use in economic applications. So implicit function theorem again, it'll be reproducing this with different notation. So let's quickly say, let theta subset of Rm and capital X subset of Rn be open sets. Uh, we have a function capital F from the parameter space cross the decision space into Rn. And that's going to be a C1 function. We're going to have a specific point, theta bar, x bar, in capital theta cross capital X. And uh, we're going to have C, again, be uh, F of, in this case, theta bar, x bar. So exactly what we have over here, and let's just note that that's, of course, going to be in Rn again. So it's exactly the same as over here, just translating the notation. So here we're going to have, if the derivative of the f function, derivatives of the f function, with respect to the target variables. That's the key phrase to keep in mind to guide you in using the implicit function theorem. We're talking about the derivative of these, this f function with respect to the target variables. The target variables over here are the x's. So this is going to now be f sub x. And of course, that's potentially confusing because that f sub x could obviously be confused with this f sub x here. But they're not the same. Here, the x's are the target variables. They're like the y's over here. Okay, If f sub x is non-singular at theta bar x bar, then there exists a C1 function f from a neighborhood in the parameter space into the decision space. Parameters replace the x's here. This should be capital X because it's it could be capital or lower, lowercase, doesn't matter which notation you use, but it's in the x space, a neighborhood in the x space. And uh, oh, and I left something out here. I left something out here. This, this, I should have said, there's a C1 function on a neighborhood n sub capital X, say, of uh, x bar. That's important, actually. So uh, that's a good thing we came back and, and we're doing this because it enabled me to see that I'd left something important out here. So there exists a C1 function. Again, this would say on a neighborhood of theta bar x bar that satisfies. So 
The function, of course, is going to satisfy exactly these same things. I'm just going to translate the x's. I'm going to replace with thetas because the thetas are the parameters. And the y's, I'm going to replace with x's because the x's are the decision variables. So here we have a. That's going to be f of theta bar equals x bar. b is going to be, so it's an easy translation to make. That's not a problem. This is going to be, I say it's easy, and then watch me make a mistake as I go along doing this here. Uh, for every theta in the neighborhood of theta bar x bar, it's the case that f of theta x is equal to c. So that should be f of theta and f of theta, just like over here. That wasn't the kind of mistake I was referring to a moment ago. Uh, and finally, the all about derivatives. Okay, the derivative of the decision or solution function f with respect to the parameters Uh, is going to be equal to, and let me just stop there and, and emphasize uh, what we're getting here. That is, what this is, what this c, what this derivative here is telling us in this context is it tells us how the decision variables, the target variables, the x's, will be affected, how they will change when the parameters of the problem change. That's the application of the implicit function theorem to economic situations in which the x's here, theta's over here, are parameters and uh, the target variables are being determined from the values of the parameters. And so this derivative is telling us, in fact, we could say this is telling us the partial of a theta with respect to uh, sorry, the, the partial of a, there I did make the kind of mistake I was referring to. This is telling us the partial of uh, an x uh, decision variable with respect to a, a change in one of the parameters. So this is the matrix of these. In fact, this is also partial of fi with respect to theta. J, so I could write it either way. It's how do the decision variables change when I change a parameter value. And that, of course, is going to be minus capital F. Remember, target values. The target values are the ones that, we're, that we need to verify uh, give us uh, non-singularity. So this would be the target values here are the x's. This is inverse, and this is the, uh, the parameters. And so, of course, this is n by m. This is n by n. And this is n by m. We have, we have n decision variables. So we have the derivative of n derivatives of n different uh, component functions, f, with respect to m different parameters, n by m matrix. That's, uh, that would be this matrix correspond to this matrix here. And then here we have an n by n matrix. This is, there are n decision variables. And um, there, uh, uh, we have n decision variables. Uh, and so this is going to be n by n. <laughs> and then we have uh, n decision variables and m parameters. So this is going to be n by m. And that corresponds to this matrix down here. So,
This is just as I said, all I've done here is to translate everything over here into this parameters and target variables notation. And instead of using Q, which is a sort of a specific uh, notation for the Cournot duopoly problem with production, so it's quantity, I replace this with the typical decision variables or target variables, which are X's. And again, potential confusion, the X's go to thetas and the Y's go to X's. So there's this potential, real potential for confusion here, but that's just, as I said, that's just the way it is, <laughs> okay? We use X's in economics for these decision variables, the target variables all the time. Uh, on the mathematics side, we use X's for the things in the domain over here. And so you just have to get adept at kind of the footwork here of being able to go back and forth between the two when necessary. So this now gives us the implicit function theorem, the exact same theorem written in two different formats. But the theorem is completely the same theorem, just with the letters changed around. And so what I want to do to conclude today's lecture then is uh, I want to do an application to utility theory. Um, and uh, that we will put uh, over here, I think, and we'll retain this over here. So we'll take this off, come back and do an application to utility theory, and that'll wrap it up for uh, the lecture today. But then I think I will come back, as I mentioned, and uh, perhaps record another lecture, which will be a kind of just an example lecture, where we apply uh, the implicit function theorem to demand theory and uh, we actually carry out some of the matrix algebra that's involved in applying the uh, implicit function theorem. So we'll take this off, come back and do a utility theory example, and uh, then I'll wrap it up for a day. Okay, so now uh, we're gonna conclude by doing a little example. Uh, it's a your <laughs> completely familiar example. Uh, utility theory, uh, preference theory, uh, where we're gonna be looking at an indifference curve. So let's say what we have is a utility function. I'm just going to write it as u of x and y. Um, and uh, and a difference curve, and a difference curve. And An indifference curve through a point or a bundle, we often say, through so this is a problem with just two consumption goods, two variables, um, and the uh, indifference curve. I'll use capital I as its name, and it's just the set of all X's and Y's in R2 plus, because we don't think of the consumer as consuming negative amounts of things, such that U of X, Y equals C. So you might guess that the U is going to play the role of the capital F over here, and indeed it is, and of course, uh, in this case, n and m are both going to be 1. So this is going to look a little bit like the example we had a little earlier in the lecture over here with the nonlinear curve over here. And so uh, here we have, I'm going to draw a picture of this here. And so we have, uh, let's say we have an indifference curve that looks like this. So this is the set i, the indifference curve. This is the point. x bar, y bar, let's say. This is, let's say, the gradient of u. And notice that ux, ui, ui are both strictly positive with that particular gradient. That is, the indifference curve is sloping downward, not vertical, not horizontal, at this point. And so, since uy in particular is not zero, 
what we know is that there exists a function that goes from some neighborhood in this x space, some neighborhood of x, uh, of x bar, uh, into, uh, in this case, goes into just R. It satisfies U of x bar equals y bar. B for every x in that neighborhood. Uh, u of x and f of x equals c. Again, u is playing the role of capital F. And last, the derivative f sub x. Uh, and here, since this is a, this is a uh, simple real function, Let's write this as we had before. Let's say f prime uh, at x bar is equal to uh, the uh, is equal to um, minus u x over u y, where those are the two partial derivatives. And, of course, what that's telling us is just that if I draw a tangent line here, this is not a budget constraint. It looks like a budget constraint, of course. It's not a budget constraint. This is just the tangent line to the indifference curve here. And it's the case here that this is ux delta x plus uy delta y equals zero along this tangent line. And we could say this equation, if I now rewrite this equation, I get delta y over delta x is minus ux over uy. It's the same thing as this down here, okay? And of course, that's evaluated at x bar, just as it says over here. Evaluated at x bar um, because, of course, the derivative is different as I move along the indifference curve. And so finally, let's uh, recall from intermediate microeconomics, if you like, that this is nothing but the marginal rate of substitution. So we define the marginal rate of substitution to be ux over uy. Some people define it to be minus ux over uy. Um, I, which makes the marginal rate of substitution negative. Uh, I think for most people, uh, they define the marginal rate of substitution to be this ratio here, which is, of course, the negative of the slope. The slope's negative, marginal rate of substitution is positive. And so this is what we get for the marginal rate of substitution, and that's a definition of the marginal rate of substitution. So I'll put the little colon over here. That's the marginal rate of substitution, of course, at x bar, y bar, just like over here, okay? And of course now, you'll notice that we could do this because u sub y is not zero. So what would happen if u of y, u sub y, uh, is zero? Well, actually, let's back up a little bit. Let's notice that if the indifference, if I had drawn the indifference curve this way, so that this is gradient u, and this is x bar, y bar, then let's clean this up a little bit here. If I had drawn the indifference curve this way so that the u sub x is zero, but u sub y is still positive. In fact, let me write that in here. u y is positive. Everything still works fine. And you can say, well, indifference curves don't typically look like this. They're, you, typically, we have the, the, the partial derivatives are positive. That's not necessarily the case. In fact, when I teach 
uh, microeconomics, even intermediate micro, and certainly also in the graduate microeconomics course that I teach. Uh, I have a, a number of good examples in which the uh, preference utility function has this character. That is that uh, the indifference curves can bend backwards so that they, you are increasing in this direction but not necessarily uh, in, uh, in this direction. Everything works fine. The marginal rate of substitution, of course, is zero here. Marginal rate of substitution is zero because that's zero. And of course, that means the value of the x good measured in terms of the y good that you'd give up to get it is zero. You don't want more of the x good because that derivative is zero. But of course, if the indifference curve had looked like this, and this was the gradient, because this is, I won't write it, but this is x bar, y bar here. It's getting a little messy, so I'd be a little constrained in writing that here. So if this is the indifference curve, this is x bar, y bar, this is the gradient, now I have u sub x is positive and u sub y is negative. Whoop, is zero, sorry. <laughs> That's not right. That u sub y is zero. And so, of course, I can't do this. I can't define the marginal rate of substitution for x in terms of y, but I can reverse it and define the marginal rate of substitution of y in terms of x. So let's just say here I could define the marginal rate of substitution. Here I didn't put any subscripts on this, but here I'm going to put subscripts to say this is the marginal value of the y good measured in terms of the x good that you'd give up to get it. That's zero. Well, in fact, let's first write the, let's first write the, that we would define this to be u sub y over u sub x, just the reverse of this, and the, the reverse of this here, and that would be zero here in this example because u sub y is zero, u sub x is positive. And so, uh, again, everything works fine, it's just that we need to reverse uh, uh, our notion of marginal rate of substitution in this case. And then let me say kind of to finish off, and maybe I'll put that uh, down here, uh, that if we have more than two variables, I could define the marginal rate of substitution between the ith variable and the jth variable, consumption variables. I would just define this to be the u sub uh, u sub i divided by u sub j. This would be the value of the ith good in terms of the jth good that you would give up to get that. So the person's internal marginal value of the good i in terms of good j. And that's still perfectly well defined even in the multivariate, in the multivariate case. So this is a simple, familiar uh, notions, uh, but you can see that we can treat it as a, a simple application of the implicit function theorem here, which gives us the marginal rate of substitution, even in this general case here. But notice one other thing. I said that the typical application of the implicit function theorem in economics is one of two kinds. Uh, optimization, maximization and minimization of some objective function, and secondly, equilibrium analysis. This is neither one. And notice that I didn't use that parametric notation. I didn't have any thetas in it because there's no, there's no parameters in the analysis that we're doing right here. So basically, this kind of notation is probably the best notation to use for this utility theory, marginal rate of substitution application of the implicit function theorem in economics. Um, and I guess that really wraps things up for today. Uh, that gives us a pretty complete picture of the implicit function theorem, except that the one thing that it doesn't do, and I think would be useful to do, and I will give you certainly one or two exercises on this, and I will, as I said, probably come back and do a, an example lecture. Um, 
in which we apply the implicit function theorem where we really need to do the matrix algebra that's implied by C down here. So that's it for today. Uh, see you all next time.